occurred. So what's my proposition if we can't do this? And land use is a perfectly good place to look at it. I want to suggest that the incentives for change at scale, not in small projects, but at a scale that can manage climate risk, are not going to come from policies or international transfers. They're going to come from the real economy. That is the way we produce food and the way we produce fuel. And it's in those changes, which are not being driven by policy, but by much more fundamental economic uh, changes that are occurring at a much more structural level that I think the answers to the problems we're facing are going to be found. So if the Indonesian president says all the time, uh, we must be uh, pro-growth, pro-poor, pro-jobs, and number four is environment. Or as another friend said the other day, it has to be bottom line first, poverty reduction second, sustainability third. The first point to understand is that these things have to be done together in a way that is self-reinforcing or self-interested at the national level. And secondly, that it is not just climate that is changing. The fundamental nature of the agricultural economy is changing. In other words, how you get to the bottom line is changing. And labor markets 20 years down the road, jobs, are not going to look anything like labor markets are today. They're changing for reasons that are quite determined in the broader economy. Now, we can see, if we look at agriculture around the world, some of these changes are already taking place just because they're more productive and just because markets are driving them. But the basic problem we face is that structural change is slow and it's uneven. And so what we really have to do is to understand the direction of the economy and think about how we can actually accelerate these changes which are occurring. The presenting problem we see all around the world has to do with resource productivity. Whether it is land, water, fuels, the chemicals we derive from fuels through petrochemistry, all of these things are becoming more expensive. They can't be treated any longer as effectively close, close to zero cost. And what we are seeing are fundamental changes at the systemic level, meaning technology, organization, finance, and um, risk management that are, have to be associated in moving systems from one form of organization, industrial organization, to another. Now, what we call production and protection is simply a program to accelerate in the agricultural sector and in the management of our capital stocks these uh, changes that we think are already underway, but can be done much more quickly with much reduction of the damage we would incur in this transition period if they can actually be nurtured and moved ahead. If Andrew, if I'll just take one more second, what are the main things we think are the sources of these productivity gains? I'm going to list five and happy to talk about them in much greater detail in, in the conversations that follow. One. There, the past production processes have led to enormous waste of resources. They have been resource intensive, so there is great opportunity to convert land or other resources that have essentially been used up and wasted, but are still perfectly capable of production if they are returned with knowledge and, and organization to operations. Number two. We have tremendous increases in the applications of information technology, material science, um, to increasing production in the agricultural sector. Many of these are upstream, but most of them are downstream. They are in the way we organize things, the way we bring credit and finance to it, the way we manage risk, whether it's price risk or supply risk. And the biggest point is these value gains that can really improve the productivity are largely available at scale. In other words, they are not accessible to small disaggregated production units, smallholders, if you will, by themselves. But they can be delivered if we think about shifting the organization of the sector, 
to arrangements that bring together organizations at scale with smallholders, whether organized in collectives or other forms to do that. So conversion, productivity, which is largely at scale and downstream, environmental integration. People are talking about landscapes. I think that's absolutely right. You can only enforce in a landscape to hold down costs, but more important is the fact that we are probably talking when we think about the value of environmental assets in the flows from those assets, ecosystem flows. I think we'd be a lot better if we talked about capital stocks rather than capital flows. And we're talking about managing a national portfolio in which natural capital is the way that you get at the two things good portfolio management demands, liquidity and diversity. So I think we have to change the frame in which we're doing things. And the last two things that I would point out, it must be done through positive incentives. This is not going to work by threatening people, including if you don't do X, we're not buying your products. It's simply not an effective way of dealing with incentives in general. I think there are ways to use national budgets and the way that you tax and redirect the incremental revenues from productivity that are the ways that we can create these incentives. Tom. My last point, the delivery has to be public and private. You cannot do this without public authority, but the public does not have the expertise no. to deliver these sources of productivity value. And I apologize, Andrew, for taking so long. No problem, Tom. We, we need to give the other panelists the chance, but that's great. I think uh, Tom has given us much food for thought in questioning many of the assumptions that still underpin the debates around the potentials of carbon and forest carbon markets, and I'm sure we'll come back to that discussion, but also a set of options in terms of some alternatives in terms of ways forward. So this is, this is very encouraging. Um, Tom also raised the whole issue of risk management and the question of access to credit and finance. So it's my pleasure now to introduce Lou Munden, uh, and Lou will explore a little bit more some of the ideas that are emerging around the idea of something called the Landscape Fund. Lou. Thanks. Uh, everybody here? Yeah. It's on? Good? Okay. Um, first off, I'd associate myself with pretty much everything you said. Um, I think that that provides a tremendously helpful overall context. I'll get a little bit more specific. Uh, one of the questions that we wanted to address in this panel uh, for everybody is how you stimulate investments in smallholders and landscapes uh, for green returns. Now, let's be blunt about this. If I had all the money and inclination in the world, you could not currently convince me to do this. And the reason is, is because you lack evidence that it works and you lack the proper financing schemes for me to deploy my capital in an effective, incredible way. Those two problems must be addressed. I'll start by the evidence. Simplified example, most agriculture, uh, forestry, things like that run on the basis of credit. Let's imagine that all of you are soybean farmers. Come to, uh, uh, to me, I'm a bank, uh, looking for an operating uh, loan. In other words, you're looking for credit. Uh, credit, from the Latin verb credere, to believe. So when you come to me, I must believe that your proposition is going to work out and I'm going to end up with more money at the end of this uh, than I started with, right? Now, as a soybean farmer, I can do that on the basis of the historical evidence which conventional forms of agriculture have compiled over decades showing your performance. I have a basis quantitatively to price your credit properly and know that I'm going to generate a return. Very easy transaction for me to make. Now, let's imagine that you all have a very different sort of profession and you come to me for the same sort of loan. Let's imagine that you are clowns in a circus, okay? So you come to me, you say, I want this operating loan. Uh, I need to buy a new red nose, maybe some white makeup, learn to make some different balloon animals, all that sort of stuff. Uh, you are going through, from a business standpoint, the same process. I'm giving you capital. You're taking that and investing in what it is that you know how to do, right? And you're going to give me more money at the end of this than I started off with. But that's an absurd transaction. Now, it's an absurd transaction not because of what you do. It's only absurd financially because 
you lack the evidence to present to me to give you the money. I'm a banker. I have very few taboos. I'll lend to the clowns. I'll lend to the guys you shoot out of the cannons. I'll lend to trapeze artists. I'll lend to anybody if you can present me with a quantitative basis upon which to make that decision. And that's the problem right now. Whether you're talking about landscape approaches, whether you're talking about smallholders, and any number of different things that you talked about in your speech, you do not have the numbers to show me to say that this will work, and therefore you will not get my money. And that's all there is to it. Now, it's a real pity, in my opinion, that a lot of folks have spent so much time trying to think about how to constitute new asset classes in order to get capital moving, things like carbon or environmental services or things like that, where you cannot even answer the fundamental question of why anyone would buy this stuff in the first place, mm -hmm. instead of focusing on the guys that have the money and trying to figure out what would get them to buy what you are selling. Now, from that perspective, it seems to me far more productive for us to focus our time on processes in agriculture and forestry, agroforestry systems, which result in tangible, saleable products, whether commodities or some other thing, but things that people already will buy because they intend to use or consume them. Those processes, it seems to me, are capable of generating the types of cash flows that we need to be interested in. I'm going to talk about one way to do that, which is a C4-led effort that we're a part of called the Landscape Fund. Um, but I don't mean to imply with these remarks that it's the only way to get at that. There are any number of different ways that we can, that we can approach these and similar problems, but this happens to be one that I know pretty well and think pretty highly of, and I'm optimistic about the, about the future potential of. In really simple terms, what you can think of as being the landscape fund is a fusion between two concepts. Uh, one is C4's tremendous work on rigorous sustainability requirements and verification processes and, and that sort of stuff, which uh, comes from a lot of the work that Andrew has done and a lot of work that, that, that Peter Holmgren has done uh, over, over the decades. Combined with the stuff that my company does, which is a very different financing vehicle for forestry, agriculture, agroforestry systems, which are sustainable uh, and, and predominantly run by smallholders. That's why we have to wait for politics also to be acting. But while we're waiting for politics, I think there's a number of other things that we could, that we could be doing. Right? So, so Louis, depending with his credit on, on the Indonesian government, for example. But, Morris, let me, let me take this discussion to, to the next level by, by linking the presentation that Pat Baza made uh, with the one you, you just made. Um, and again, I'm going to be a little bit provocative. What was clear, Pat Vassa, from your presentation is that just in one country, in one of the slides, there were, there were at least, if I can recall, five, six, seven, and there may be many more institutional arrangements which are being established to manage different types of funds. Now, the obvious question that comes with that is, what are the transaction costs associated with multiple funding mechanisms uh, in terms of an overarching ambition to try and reduce the costs and the transaction costs of doing business in the interests of smallholders. And whether this is based on carbon financing or other sources of finance is immaterial. Similarly, Moritz, for you, I mean, one of the lessons we've learned in the last few years since the 2005 COP is the multiplicity of the different standards that have been established, um, which has left, I think, the market a little bit confused about which standards do we follow, there are huge technical and financial barriers of entry to uh, comply with these standards. Uh, and what we don't see in terms of the actors who are involved in this, we rarely see any of the smallholders involved in these processes. So I wanted Basse, if you and Moritz could just respond to that before we go on to talk a little bit more about some of the aspects that were raised by Tom and Lou. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Uh, I think this is uh, the problem of the developing countries, actually, not the Indonesia, how to reduce the transaction cost. But uh, I think we committed. If we can make it uh, not unquote good for its government, for example, we can reduce the cost of the transaction. Since we learned so much actually from the process that we already have, we already have uh, experiences until now, depends on how the perspective of the government but the business. If the government still thinking that they 
will creating good and good income for the business, not from the you know normal system uh, taxation system. Maybe the, the transaction cost will increase. But if we agree that all right, we have to open the business environment rather than take it cut and cut the cost for every transaction. I believe that we can we can reducing of the transaction because this is very important for us. That's why on the the next hopefully we in line with the the, the, the problem. to this issue of the proliferation of yeah. standards and yes. Um, just for you to know, like there is FSC or PFC or others in, in the forestry world, in the carbon world, there are also different kind of standards. Um, in matter of fact, they are all very similar to each other, uh, but uh, yeah, there, there is then this diversity. Um, we, uh, as gold standard, we're pretty much the only standard trying to really joint process. We are in uh, cooperation with FSC, with Fair Trade, with Rainforest Alliance now, and we are talking also with uh, with VCS on the table of the UN. The UN invited us to sit around the table and to, and to join forces. So we are trying to go down this um, uh, this, this way, um, but it's it's not easy. Let's put it this way. <laughs> Uh, on the other hand, I would encourage also governments which are currently creating carbon markets not to recreate their own rules. Um, please. Of the rural economies that we are talking about, where the forests are. Now, the World Bank Group knows this problem already for since its uh, inception in the 40s. And the United Nations knows this problem as well. Now, my question is, how come that there is no focus on formalizing the economy? of the developing countries, of formalizing the, company, uh, the, the formalizing the economy. I know that there is an initiative of Apanas of, of, of doing that. Now, many of the negative perceptions that are being built in the West for not being, for excusing, we are not going to buy from you in Asia, are that perceptions, not based on evidence. Thank you very much. And so I would like to have a response. Why is that all continued attention on what you mentioned on formalizing the economy of the societies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yalmaz, do you want to make a start with that? I'd like you to take the first on the formalizing economies, and then I'll take it from I think uh, the experience at, at C4 that has done research on processes of formalization has recognized that there are trade-offs. I would agree with you to a certain extent that I think uh, perceptions aren't always... Can I just take a quick Hang on, I'm sorry, let me see it's just quick, so quickly, Peter, thanks for the question. I would say that it, if you look at the whole situation fairly and honestly, perceptions, negative perceptions have come from some evidence as well. That you, you have to give that some, um, you've got to believe that, it, it, it's a fact. And as we, as we transition from evidence of negative to evidence of positive, equally there needs to be independent evaluation of transition to positive. I think APP is starting to take this path and ask external independent entities to look at commitments and validate that those commitments are, are unfolding in a positive way. Um, and I think that's exactly the, the, the journey we need to be on. That's the way you get over the negatives of the past by proving the positives of the future. Tom, a quick comment. Yeah, so I, I think this is a really interesting point. And if I could return, I know some of you may have been in the plenary this morning to what uh, Mr. Vijaya said, for example, in another part of Sinarmas, um, about the loans that were being made to smallholders in this very interesting program that he has worked through with Kadeem. Uh, and, and I think that's absolutely the right way to go. But I'll point out that works because the risk is being taken in guarantees by Golden Agri. Okay? No one's going to lend to those smallholders whether or not they have formal title to the land. On the other side, we heard, um, maybe if it's securitized, we'll talk about that. We, we also heard the gentleman from Ola who talked about the fact that he could get a formal permit from the central government but he couldn't cover the risk of the community, which was the real problem. And, and I think that's true. Whether, the, whether it can be a completely informal situation that give communities in Mozambique, where we work, 
the right to disrupt investment. And I'm talking about investments that have a long period of return. I'm saying that agriculture has to move to be knowledge intensive, organization intensive, infrastructure intensive, if you're really going to see this growth occur. Nobody's going to invest unless they're facing some kind of a risk profile that they feel really secure about. And so what's the answer? The answer is that we can't avoid politics. If we're gonna do things, we just have to really start to work in managing the risk from the ground up to the political realities that exist, whether it's in Kalimantan or somewhere else. The formalization would help, but it won't solve the problem. Uh, an old lawyer's advice about that. Two extremely quick points. The first is that the, the purpose of the landscape fund is, prim is primarily uh, formalization. It's a way to compete with informal credit markets, which we think are dysfunctional. Informal credit markets price things so high because their risk really is that high because they're lending to a very limited pool of people. We'll come up with a better product, better product by, you know, making it a more international sort of uh, uh, sort of scheme, get people into formal lending relationships. That's a functional thing that you need that you need to do. The second thing is, why do you work with research institutions? It's because of evidence, interpretation of evidence. If you look at a lot of existing data that we have on default rates uh, from uh, lending schemes uh, to small orders, that sort of stuff, you see absolutely horrific numbers. And the immediate reaction of somebody from my background is gonna be these people are dead beats. No way, I'm not doing it. But instead, if you work with folks who actually understand the full context and realities on the ground, they'll show you a lot of other evidence to go along with that, which says the reason that they default is because they're getting a product that they can never possibly afford. And that the immediately counterintuitive answer of lengthening out the time in which they have to pay actually is the right one. That's why we've got to have more relationships like this where we're kind of working together. Thanks, Luke. There was a gentleman in the front, and then let it back. Hi, thanks, Andrew. My name is Eka Kinting from Jagarimba. Rimba. Our subsidiary is Rimbaraya Conservation, uh, who have been founding our heads uh, for the past five years in Indonesia to create the first forest conservation uh, project in Indonesia that has actually uh, delivered credits uh, last year. So uh, we hope that should be uh, satisfactory to the concern of you know, show us one path of the money uh, as an experience. Now, my key questions, uh, my, uh, I have two questions. First is for the, for the financiers up front. Uh, if I want to replicate this exercise, now you know, I have three more projects to $4 million each to maybe 2 million hectares, you know, needing $200 million. Now, how would you advise me about doing that, given that we've done the first one, we're now the largest producer of this uh, uh, RADD carbon credit project in the world? And the second question to everybody on the, on the panel is about demand. That's one thing that we've been hearing, right? and this is also re uh, related to our effort to raise financing to replicate the uh, exercise, is that, can you show me demand? Now, uh, I'm sure there are probably a thousand, two thousand people attending this conference, half of them flying from the US to, uh, uh, the, uh, from Europe, from Australia, etc. each probably generating, generating about four to five tons worth of uh, carbon footprint. Are we all uh, offsetting our footprints? Maybe that's one way for us to create demand just amongst ourselves. But in relation to what uh, the gentleman from Office Depot is saying, one company like Singapore Airlines last year announced their carbon footprint is about 34 million tons. That should be enough to support 10 projects like ours, be they out of the concern, uh, the consideration of the, of the company itself, or maybe forced by the government or the customers. And you can pass it on to the customers. I, I would actually uh, like to congratulate some companies uh, out of the U.S. are now here in the, mar uh, in the market buying carbon credits from us. So I'd definitely like to talk to Office Depot about that too, about real demand uh, for the projects. Thank you. We can see clearly there's a new bridge. This is like very simple. Red plus coming, money coming. But they never know but what is the requirement to get the money itself. They think that is make it easy, but this is very, very difficult to ask actually. That's why I say that. Why not we start it with the improving our forest governance first and then most step by step going to the market. Timbaraya is already making the you know business. The other also make it business. But again, you have so many obstacles because we are not ready. Not only on the government but also on the 
the private sector also for the community itself. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. There was another question. Please, yes. Hi, um, I'm Sheila Whitley. I'm with the Overseas Development Institute. I'm focused on private investment and the concept of climate finance. And I was really interested, Lou, in your, and I guess in the more general discussion also about formalization, particularly in the context of, of finance and borrowing. And I was wondering what the challenges were of actually not just changing the finance sector's practices, but also borrowers' practices. Because I'm imagining that smallholders are used to borrowing in an informal market. There's also needs to be some kind of a sales pitch for them to borrow differently, and I was wondering how you undertake that and how much lessons there might be from sort of microfinance or microcredit in terms of what you're doing. The, the couple of uh, very direct answers to that question. The first is, is that we don't know enough about how to do this yet. There's not enough existing evidence that we have, so we've got to go out there and make the evidence, and we're going to have to go out there and make some mistakes. Um, our predisposition is to think about this as an aggregation problem, that the counterparty to any facility like the Landscape Fund should not be all the way down to the individual smallholder level, but rather some sort of entity. It could be a producer organization, or it could be a local credit institution um, that manages that book, essentially. Manages those, those relationships. Um, it seems to us that in the process of making test loans, uh, we're probably going to be a lot smarter uh, than, than we are right now, and there may be some distinctions between the types of institutions and the types of lending relationships that you want them in. So, for example, if you're doing a, uh, a loan for equipment or that sort of stuff, you may have a preference for a certain sort of institution, whereas if you're making an operating loan, you may have a preference for a very different type of institution. All of these things we do not know, and I would point out that one of the major reasons that we do not know this stuff is because everybody's been focused on answering very different questions about how to constitute new derivatives markets. So we've got some catching up to do. Thanks very much, Lou. Another question, the gentleman in the front. Hi, my name is Sam Mack, I'm with Dalbert Global Development Advisors. I've, I've heard kind of three different themes come through. So first is there's a very much a recognition of climate change and deforestation as a challenge, and that the private sector needs to be part of it. The second is some frustration about multilateral um, political actions, while recognition that there's some really important national and subnational level activities. And then the third is that within the private sector practices, there's very much a vision to continue at, with using existing, existing approaches. And that could be kind of the need for an evidence base, that could be the decide to be able to sell certain products at a premium, but certainly not to take a loss. Um, that could be kind of a real focus on liquidity around kind of how you pr develop financial products. But kind of given this kind of, on one hand, a recognition of a need for a private sector role, on the other hand, a recognition that the public sector might not be able to do it alone. And third, a recognition that, that the private sector wants to continue to kind of operating using standard practices. What's a realistic expectation for the private sector to really participate in helping find the solution? Okay, I'll put that to Morris. Just... Individual side, I can't see a movement in terms of uh, the, the having the power to push in the right direction. So it's. Um, then the question if the if the organizations have the right CEO in place um, to be moving in the right direction. And uh, this depends on on the media. Um, and then the media, again, certain journalists, if they have the right thoughts and moving in the right direction. So um, here I can see in, a, in some countries where, where the media, again, reflecting the views of society, um, are very active, you can see a lot of movement. Um, also within the companies. And then media is also controlling then the governments. And uh, also here you see uh, in certain countries that the, the green parties are growing. Um, but in, in matter of fact, what, I, what you see here is uh, eventually it is, in my opinion, the lead role of the government to be trying to, to set the rules um, because later on the companies are always thinking about money and uh, and the competitiveness uh, in to to other to other companies. 
So on an international scale, that's a little bit difficult because we're, as, we, as we're hearing the international agreements, that's um, uh, hard to agree on. But if they are really only having national competitors, then within a, within a country you can really create a green growth in this regard when the government is acting. Can I just read one? I think what, one thing you said is that the private sector wants to work only within its own structures and basically not... My interpretation of your question is not evolve very much. But I would say if there are signals created that allow the private sector to act, to make decisions that support positive um, improvements towards sustainability, then many, many significant private sector actors are willing, willing to play. Um, use FSC as, a, as, a, as one example. That's a simple symbol of improvement. And in it's just one company example, from 0% to 23% FSC volume in North America in a few years. We could still go much further, but that's an example of a simple, si simple signal that the market offers of a better practice that we can support. Yes, and just, just to echo that, I think if I'm not mistaken, perhaps somebody in the audience can correct me, I think within the Asian region we only have 4% uh, that has actually been certified. Most of that linked to supply chains rather than national sustainable forest management. So there's still a huge scope sure. uh, to expand that. Tom, just one last um, one more question. I mean, I think these are, these are really good questions. And it makes something out of all. So come back to the river ride question for a moment. I assume you're selling into the voluntary markets at the present time. You say, what could we advise you to really expand the scale, move it up by four or five? That's going to come, that can't be done through the voluntary markets. It's going to have to come because you have some regulatory structure set up by the Indonesian government that can expand the scale. And that depends on the negotiations about which I am relatively uh, not optimistic. But let me just flip your question into the energy area for a second. If we're talking about renewable energy, which costs three or four cents a kilowatt hour more than whatever is being used, coal, whatever, then unless the private, unless the public sector basically comes up with some kind of a policy, either to bear those costs on the tax base or to force the consumer base to buy it, the private sector is not going to come along. But if the, if, the, if the government does that, and it's a credible policy, then the private sector is going to come in with the usual 80% leverage rates. So there's not a general answer to, that, to, to the question. It depends on the structure. What I would say is, look at the speed with which the private sector has essentially eliminated coal from the U.S. electricity base. It happened in a couple of years. A, an enormous change. Why? because the price has shifted. The relative price has shifted, and there the public, the private sector, is fantastic at picking these things up. But if you ask me the question, gee, is that gonna happen in China? Even if we bring down those gas coal spreads, the answer is that unless the Chinese government takes on the system costs of building out gas pipelines, it's not going to happen. So I can't give you a general answer to those questions, and it all depends on the scale we're talking about. As long as we're talking about small scale, the private sector can do a lot in the context that is currently there. But if we're talking about the scale that will do something about the climate risk our children are facing, that cannot be done by the private sector alone. And the question is, what's going to drive the change in public policy? Changes in the international negotiations, or changes in the fact that from a competitive standpoint, some governments decide that in the end, it's going to be cheaper to use zero marginal cost fuel. The air, the, the tides, the sun, than it is to continue with, against the risk of rising variable cost fuel. And so there's no general answer, but scale matters a lot, even in the question of who has to do what. Thanks, Bill. We haven't yet addressed the issue of perverse incentives uh, in terms of the panel presentations, but this is clearly one aspect where governments can play a role. We look at Indonesia, I think if I'm not mistaken, 12% of the annual budget is actually approved 
for fossil fuel subsidies. This is an elephant in the room in my mind. There is one last gentleman who had a question. Sorry, one last question. Uh, because we, we are coming to that, so please. Yeah, I'll try to make this quite quick. Uh, my name is Luke Richard, and I'm with the Governor's Climate and Forest Fund, and I have a question for Lou about the Landscape Fund. Um, certainly the ideas that you were talking about is something that the GCF has explored um, in some of our jurisdictions, uh, looking at different financing mechanisms to encourage, encourage deforestation-free commodity production, and particularly we're looking in Brazil um, at, at providing prefer preferential grants to producers that take on various environmental commitments, particularly registering in the Rural Environmental Registry and undertaking other commitments. One thing that I didn't get from your presentation was what the link is between uh, this new asset class that you're talking about, preferential loans, and environmental performance. So what are the environmental performance requirements, and how's that going to be monitored as this uh, new asset class is developed? Very quickly, the counterparty to the fund is an aggregator, which has a number of different loans under that, under that aggregator. Uh, the aggregator has a condition under which it can expand that loan book via access to capital from the fund. That access is turned off if they don't comply with environmental uh, uh, requirements, sustainability requirements. Apparently. Those sustainability requirements, again, are on the, on the, on the C-Force side, so I, I can't give you a detailed explanation of, of precisely uh, uh, how they work. Uh, but, but the idea is, is that there is a conditional access to an expanding capacity to make uh, uh, to make loans. That's how you do it. Maybe we can follow up after. We can follow up on the, the preliminary work that's been done on defining those systems and those projects. Let's get, because everyone's still sitting in their seats, you obviously can wait a bit longer for your coffee. So, would you like to ask another question? Thank you. Very much. Chris Bennett from the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Uh, I find it very exciting when somebody talked about diverse incentives and public policy. And uh, one of the assumptions, it seems to me, uh, has been that we need external financing by whatever means, uh, be it through political action, be it through the private sector. But we do face uh, public policies that undervalue the resources which we're trying to provide additional financing for. And I'm thinking particularly of uh, public policies which reduce demand for timber and non-timber forest products such as in Indonesia and, and other countries, uh, export bans on logs and timber, export bans on sawn timber, export bans on raw and semi-finished rotan, all of which undervalue the resource which we're trying to find additional finance uh, to increase the value of. And there's a contradiction here. And I wonder to what extent the panel thinks that we should uh, also work on uh, rectifying these policies that provide uh, perverse incentives that undervalue the resources we're trying to find additional finance for. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris, for an observation. I think Lou wants just to quickly respond. Just a, a, very quickly, a, two things. Uh, first is, is that um, uh, one of the major obstacles uh, to, to, to making these sorts of investments is the uh, proliferation of these regulatory structures and trying to understand what they do and do not allow an operation to do. That's a big part of the diligence process, and that can get handled. If you can have clarity uh, around that around that sort of stuff, that that would actually make things a lot simpler, uh, uh, particularly in, in, in developing countries. The second thing is, is that there's a different sort of um, uh, uh, I don't know if it's a perverse incentive, uh, but there's there, there's a different sort of public policy decision which is made which causes a number of problems, which is that from a regulatory standpoint, there are a number of different systemically important banks, you know, large corporations, that sort of stuff, who should probably take climate risk uh, in, into account. Uh, uh, in terms of making long-term projections. They're not currently required to do so by their regulators. It seems to me that the introduction of such a requirement would, ask, would force them to ask a number of questions which they do not currently ask, not in a particularly onerous way, uh, and probably have the dual benefit of increasing the stability of those companies uh, over the long term, and at the same time, incentivizing them to invest in a couple of uh, uh, exploratory processes so we can understand these risks better. Tom, one last quick comment. Yeah, we, we just finished a big piece of work. It will be out in June.